that I've just felt really drawn to Ephesians chapter 1 all week. I've just been dwelling in Ephesians chapter 1. I haven't prepared a preach. I've got no notes. I just want to spend a bit of time just marveling in Ephesians chapter 1 to draw us into communion. I'm not going to make a habit out of leading worship and doing this, um, but there's just something about today to just dwell on the truth in Ephesians 1. So if you've got a Bible with you, um, or it will be on the screen as well. I've bought my uh, trusty Bible that I use at home all the time for all of my quiet times, and it's full of um, squiggles and notes I can barely read. This is such a precious thing, isn't it? Just, I just spent time in these 14 verses, Ephesians 1, verse 1 to 14, all week, and it's been blessing me all week. So I'll read it through once. We'll let the Holy Spirit do what he wants to do. And I just want to expand on it and lead us into communion that way because it's flipping awesome. Holy Spirit, we just invite you. Would you speak through this word that you've inspired? This is your word. You ministered to me. Lord, would it expand out, minister to all of us? Just thank you for your presence and your goodness. Thank you, Lord. So Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time, to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance, until we acquire possession of it, to the praise of his glory." Wow. (laughs) I used to read that in my kind of first half of my life and think, "Eh, it's pretty good. And I remember reading things like this post-airing cupboard and just being like, wow, I can't believe he's talking about me in this verse. This is just incredible. This is a letter written to the Ephesians. 2,000 years ago, the church in Ephesus, a place in ancient Greece, now part of Turkey. This is a a city that was a a center of trade. Um, It had kind of really significant elements about it. It had the Temple of Artemis, which was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. It had the largest amphitheater in the whole world. This was um, quite a significant place. And Paul came here and ministered. And amongst that kind of really secular, bustling place, people got saved. People gave their lives to Jesus and a church formed. And Paul was with them for a while. And then fast forward, he's written this letter, probably from imprisonment in Rome, to these people that he loves. And what a letter. Can you imagine receiving a letter and you didn't necessarily know all of this stuff? (laughs) 
Most of the stuff I get through the post is bills. You get a letter like this. It says to the saints who are in Ephesus, we, we can actually legitimately substitute in there Rugeley, Colton, the Haywards, Heath Hayes, wherever we live. To the saints, to the holy ones set apart, those ones that God has called and saved. That's us. This letter is written to the people in Ephesus and the people here right now who are faithful in Christ Jesus. He says, grace to you and peace from God our Father, God our Father. There's so many things you can just quickly read over in this. He just, he's mentioned grace already, this incredible doctrine of this favor and kindness that we don't deserve that he later says in this passage is lavished on us, this amazing grace and peace. Peace, which actually is a miracle because we're born at enmity with God, separated from God, deserving the wrath of God, and yet now have peace from God, our Father. That just floors me every time because that means we can say he's our Father, the God who created the whole universe. Rob was praying this morning, marveling at the fact that the whole universe is held in his hand. This mighty, kind of unfathomable being that has always been, we can call him our father. And maybe you haven't had the most positive father figure in your life. This is everything, the most perfect father figure you can ever imagine. One who's completely for you, loves you always, never punishes you, just disciplines you to grow you for your own good, for you to blossom and thrive. Our father and the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord, our ruler, Jesus, the one who stepped down and took on a, a, a name that was as common as Jim. Jesus Christ, our Messiah. I mean, just in those first two verses, I mean, we could preach for ages on that. I just marvel at all of that. I, I, this might be quite a long time we're here today. I apologize for that. He says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. What does it mean, blessed be? It's not that we've got to bless him as if he's lacking or um, somehow needs our blessing. No, it's recognizing his worth. It's praising him. We bless you, Lord. God the Father of our, our Lord Jesus Christ. There it is. I just love that little three-letter word. Our Lord Jesus Christ. He's ours. If we have put our faith in him and followed him, Jesus is ours. I am his and he is mine. Wow. And I, I used to believe he saved me. He, he, a couple of weeks ago I mentioned I felt in my early life he, he, he kind of loves me. He tolerates me. He's going to let me into heaven by the skin of my teeth. He might bless me with a few things. But actually, no. What's he blessed us with? He's blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. He's blessed us. Blessing this is this positive thing that he has given to us for our benefit in Christ because we are in Christ. If we put our faith in Christ, we're literally in Christ so that when he died on the cross, we died. Died to sin. Died to hell and death and Satan and the world and everything. And when Jesus rose, because we are in him, we rose if we put our faith in him. We rose to new life, new creation. We're in Christ. So often you hear Paul use these words, in Christ. Just remember that always. I'm in Christ. <laughs> That's a very, very safe place to be, a very, very good place to be. Always in Christ. And he's blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. And what on earth does that mean? Well, he's going to actually expand on it. Basically, read the New Testament and you will see every blessing you're blessed with. Lots of big word, words. You're, you're redeemed, you're justified, you're saved, you're sanctified. All these big words we're blessed with. We're redeemed, we're set free. We're justified, as in, it's as if we'd never sinned. Remember me with my dirty cloth and my white cloth at Levi's baptism. The perfect exchange going on. He's blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places because later on in Ephesians is the mind-boggling thing that Jesus is seated now in heavenly places. But in chapter 2, 
we are seated in heavenly places with him. But, I, but I'm, I'm in a sports hall in Rugeley. It doesn't feel very heavenly. And yet, in our identity, in our destiny, something that is secure forever if we've put our faith in Jesus, we're literally seated with him because we're in him. That's mind-boggling, isn't it? You can't fully understand that. <laughs> but it's true. Seated with him, blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him. If you feel insignificant, if you feel rubbish, if you just put your faith in Jesus, it means he's chosen you. Again, the God of the whole universe, this awesome, all-powerful, all-knowing God, before the foundation of the world, chose you. Every time the devil whispers his doubts in your ear, you're not saved. Think about how much you've sinned this week. You're not as good as that guy who seems to know his Bible really well. You're not good as that guy who seems to be worshipping with his hands up in the air in abandon. You can say, Oi, devil, no! I'm chosen before the foundation of the world that I should be holy and blameless before him before a perfect holy God. How on earth can I be holy and blameless before a perfect God? Because I'm in Christ. I am a new creation. The old has passed away. Wow. It says in Romans, who can bring any charge against God's elect? Who can accuse us or condemn us of anything? We all sin. We all fall short every day. There's not a person in here who hasn't sinned already this morning whether you broke the speed limit on the way here, whether you did something that wasn't out of faith in God, whether you're in some way kind of selfish or, I don't know, you dropped something on your foot and swore. We're all sinful people, and yet, through the cross, through Jesus, he calls us holy and blameless. Wow. And rather than that just letting us off scot-free so we can go and do anything we want, that just forms in me an awed gratitude. Chris Fielding, this funny little average man, is holy and blameless before a holy and righteous God. You can say that about yourself if you put your trust in Jesus. Amazing. Some people think that in love, here goes on the end of that, and so we've got it in verse 4, holy and blameless before him in love, some people feel, in love, he predestined us. Quite often you get arguments between theologians between these two things. I just go, I say, it's both. <laughs> Holy and blameless before him, in love, because that's everything ties together in love. Or in love, he predestined us, because God does everything in love. You go right down to the core of everything he does. Love is at the root of it. He predestined us. Ooh, we're into some deep stuff here. Predestined just means he previously appointed us to something. So he chose us before the foundation of the world and appointed us to something. What did he appoint us to? It says, adoption as sons. And for any of the ladies, any, anyone watching who thinks, uh, does that exclude me then if I'm not a male? Adoption as sons, this is a legal term, very familiar to people there in the first century, it says if, if you are adopted into someone's family, you get all the rights of someone who's born into that family. So adopted as sons mean whether you are male or female, if you put your faith in Jesus, you get all the rights, everything that the son gets. We get to inherit what Jesus inherits, eternal life with him. <laughs> this has been a week, just that breakfast, it's like, oh man. <laughs> Adoption as sons, we're children of God. Again, the enemy wants to make us believe otherwise. I can't be a child of God because I'm rubbish or I don't do this or whatever. Paul says otherwise. And it's through Jesus Christ. We're going to take communion in a few minutes. Thank him. Through him, through the cross, through that atonement, on the cross, through his body broken, his blood shed, we're adopted as sons. 
according to the purpose of his will. Nothing can stop his will. Purpose here means his, like his good pleasure. It was his good pleasure and purpose to save us and adopt us into his family. He hasn't done this grudgingly. <laughs> With which, where am I? According to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace. Now, if you were really kind of tuned in when we first read it, you'll, you'll recognize this sentence has actually occurred three times. So I'm going to come back to that. The praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved, with a capital B there. Jesus is so loved by the Father that there's this overflow of love that led to us being created so we could be loved and we could glorify God and we could love each other. A constant overflow. And an overflow of that love leads to the Holy Spirit poured into us, it says in Romans. Jesus is so loved by the Father, he's called the Beloved. And we're invited into that. And we're called beloved. <laughs> Amazing. In him, in Jesus, in the beloved, we have redemption through his blood. What's redemption mean? Redeemed. It means set free. Come out of slavery. How, how many of you felt like you've been in slavery until you gave your life to Jesus? Slavery to fear. Slavery to addiction. Slavery to... Um, I don't know, your own selfish ambition or slavery to the world and all its constant changing desires and distractions. We've been redeemed, led out of the prison into freedom. We've got to remind ourselves of that all the time because we so often, I find this, so often walk back from my freedom, sit down in my cell, close the door, put my manacles back on. <laughs> oh, I'm rubbish. Or well, fine, right, I'm going to drink more wine tonight because I'm not coping. Why are we doing that? Why are we sitting in the prison when we've been freed from it? But we do it so often, don't we? And yet still God says, no condemnation. Come out. Come into freedom. I've bought it for you with the ultimate price, the blood of Jesus. Been redeemed through his blood. So again, as we take communion in a few minutes, just marvel through his blood shed, we have been set free. Whether we feel that or not, sometimes I don't feel very free as all the cares of life overwhelm. But remind yourself, I'm free. I'm free. <laughs> through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, the forgiveness of our sins, where we have trespassed into what we should never have gone into, since Adam and Eve ate that apple, we've decided to try and go our own way rather than God's way. God designed us to completely rely on him, to take all our strength, our wisdom from him, find all our joy and our peace in him, for life to truly make sense in glorifying him, in loving him and loving each other. We've trespassed off into territory we're never supposed to go into. Yet he's forgiven it all. If you read the UCB word for today, this morning, they likened it to an Etch-a-Sketch. If you've ever drawn something on an Etch-a-Sketch, I'm not very good on an Etch-a-Sketch. I've seen someone do a Mona Lisa on an Etch-a-Sketch. That's insane. What, what happens when you shake it? The, the picture goes, doesn't it? And you can't get that picture back. It's gone. However much you mourn that, uh, it looked a little bit like the Mona Lisa in a pixelated way, but it's gone. And that's what God says. I have taken your sin away. I've put it behind me as far as the east is from the west. It's gone. Infinitely far away. As far as the east is from the west. I don't know if I looked in the right direction. So. We're forgiven. And he knew all of that before the foundation of the world. And when we studied through the book of Hebrews, we thought one of the reasons that they may well have been really struggling was they thought, well, all my sins are forgiven up to when I put my faith in Jesus. But then what? What about all the sins I'm doing since? I'm still sinning. What, what happens? Is, does Jesus' blood cover that? And the writer of the Hebrews says, very much yes. You are saved, seated, sanctified. Saved from your sin." Seated in heaven with Jesus in your identity. Sanctified as in made holy. 
so you can be presented holy and blameless before him. Now, but I don't feel very holy. You know, there's a process for our lives of seeing that identity of holiness worked out practically. So I'm not always holy in my general daily life, but I am completely, utterly holy in God's eyes. Incredible. So the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. And again, this is something maybe I just didn't understand in my teens and 20s. I thought maybe his grace was something that he would kind of just give me a little bit of. (laughs) But there is an eternal, endless well of riches of his grace, this undeserved favor and kindness to us that finds its ultimate expression in Jesus. He's given us Jesus. That's what grace really is. It's Jesus and giving us everything that we need to do everything he's called us to do. Jesus is, is our righteousness. Jesus is our peace. Jesus is our love. And so there are riches abounding. And from that eternal well, he has lavished his grace on us. The language here is just fantastic, isn't it? He's lavished His grace on us, on me, on people in a little town in Staffordshire. He's lavished his grace on us in all wisdom and insight making known to us. Here is a little nod to the importance of knowledge. This knowledge that has come through miraculous means that we would know the truth, that we would know the gospel. We have to hear it. We have to understand it. And it has to be then fueled with his spirit for us to really come alive so that we would truly know an experiential knowing. What what do we know? The mystery of his will. And Paul quite often speaks about mystery, mystery of his will. What, What does he mean? Well, part of it is just this incredible gospel, this mystery that's been hidden, he says, not so that people can't find it, but hidden so we can find it and have the joy of discovery of finding this truth that we people here, none of us who are Jewish people, we're Gentiles, have been invited in to be his people through the cross. The mystery of his will, the gospel itself, according to his purpose, his goodwill, his good pleasure, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time. He's always known what he's doing, never defeated, never frustrated in that way, always knows what he's doing, always in control. So here's more of this mystery of his will. What is his will? What is God's desire? To unite all things in him, in Christ, things in heaven and things on earth. His desire throughout all the ages is to unite everything under the headship of Jesus, everything in Christ, so that everything can be kind of summed up and find its fullness and its purpose and its meaning in Jesus. Why? For the ultimate purpose, God made the whole universe in the first place so that God would be glorified. And we've seen that phrase, to the praise of his glorious grace. If he unites all things under Jesus and his enemies to be made his footstool, God the Father gets all the glory. Isn't that an amazing thing that we are gathered up into that eternal plan to unite things, all things, into Jesus? So our salvation, we're not, we're not the center of the universe. We're not the center of the gospel. Jesus is. And we're invited into that. <laughs> amazing. Let me just finish off this last bit. In him... In Jesus, we have obtained an inheritance, so we get to inherit with him eternal life. We get eternal joy. We get to worship him and never grow tired of it. We get to work in some way, in a way that's amazing, that is never tiring or frustrating. There won't be any office politics. There won't be um, getting home after a long week where you've worked too many hours and just thinking, I don't know if I could do this. No, this is a joyful work, constantly, constantly there with the king. He's invited us into that. And you know what? We don't have to wait for it to start. It started the moment that we gave our lives to him. Heaven started. It's in us. His kingdom, his rule, his reign. 
and we see more and more of his kingdom crash in every time we see a healing, every time we see someone else saved or set free, every time we learn and take on some new truth, it's heaven coming in and touching earth. We've obtained an inheritance having been predestined, previously appointed to, according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ, so these early Christians, might be to the praise of his glory, and then every Christian ever since, to the praise of his glory. In him, in Christ, when you heard the word of truth, which we actually have the full version of here, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, very important, this just doesn't just apply to you if you do good, you believe in Jesus, put your faith in him, you're sealed with a promised Holy Spirit, like a down payment, a guarantee, you are saved, you are full of God himself in the Holy Spirit form, that secures you forever, that empowers you forever, that guides you and leads you forever until we acquire full possession of it all when Jesus returns. To the praise of his glory. Now, I've purposefully not explained that sentence yet because that's where I want to finish. I don't know if you remember the old catechism, if you were brought up in Sunday school, maybe the, the older, wiser people amongst you. But one of the questions, it might have even been the first question, was uh, what is the chief end of man or the Something like that, purpose of mankind. Everyone's searching for that, really, aren't they, in everything. Why are we here? What are we doing? What's my purpose? And the answer was to glorify God and enjoy him forever. And you think, well, what, what does that mean to glorify God? What is glory? Very hard thing to define. Lots of different definitions of it. John Piper will refer to it as like his infinite beauty and worth, a kind of outward expression of God's infinite beauty, his infinite worth. Well, it's, the, it's all of the wonder and the awe of God, all the things that he is that we're not, that we would recognize that, his glory, that we would bring praise to it, that we would take all of our joy and peace from it, that all of our decision-making and everything we do and say and think is directed to it, to glorifying him. Because if that's why he made everything, then that's our purpose in life, to glorify him. And so I felt quite challenged by this. It says in Isaiah 43, God created his people so they would glorify him. Jesus says in Matthew 5, let your light shine before others. And they'll see your good works and give glory to God. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10, whether you eat or drink, in whatever you do, give glory to God. Let it be all for the glory of God. And you think, oh man, how much of my last 24 hours has, have I been intentionally <laughs> doing that? Oh, here comes the devil again. You're not good enough. You haven't been glorifying God, blah, blah, blah. Try harder. Go on, try harder. And that's not the gospel, is it? The gospel is we can't. We're rubbish. And yet in Christ, we can, and we're not rubbish. Amazing. We can glorify him. Because if we rely on him, if we trust him, if we depend on him, that glorifies him. If we pray, we're glorifying him. If we worship, we glorify him. Whether it's quietly, whether it's hands up, belting it out, out of tune, whatever it is, if our heart's towards him, we're glorifying him. If we forgive someone, we're glorifying him. That gives a whole new dimension to it, doesn't it? I really want to forgive someone now. Someone do something wrong. <laughs> I can glorify God. In our marriages, we can glorify God in how we treat our husband or wife. In our families, we can glorify God in how we treat our children or our parents or our siblings. In our workplaces, we can glorify God in how we conduct ourselves, in how we behave in a crisis. And we're not going to get it right every time. And I tell you what, don't try hard at it. <laughs> Surrender. Say, oh, Holy Spirit, thank you. You're, you're here. You're in me. You're the guarantee. Help me glorify Jesus. Because Jesus reveals the Father, and the Father gets all the glory. So, I enjoyed that. 
that's what's been blessing me all week. I've got my bookmark here. Man. I've still got my Pray for Five pledge. Praying for these guys. I can't claim it's every day, but a lot. I'm going to put that back in there. So I want to invite you in a minute to the communion table because this is where we get to really just focus and celebrate all of what I've just shared. If there's something particular that has impacted you, that's inspired you in that, spend your time when you're eating the bread and drinking the wine thanking him for it. If something that's challenged you, I'm living in unforgiveness. The Bible's quite clear. Forgive first before you take the bread and wine. This is representing what Jesus has done for you. He's died for you. His body's broken for you. His blood is shed for you. He's forgiven you. And in that light, forgive those who have trespassed against you. If it's challenged you on anything else, I've said the M word, marriage. That's a big, big one, isn't it? Don't feel any condemnation. Just come together with your spouse and say, I want to glorify God with you. And I don't quite know how, but let's pray together and invite him into it to help us. Brilliant, isn't it? We've constantly got a solution. It's prayer. And that's been our, our theme all year, prayer. Come back to him. It glorifies him. It shows our need for him and its relationship with him. Okay. With a handheld mic, this could be difficult. So I might ask for Dave's help. Dave, would you mind breaking the bread and just... Um, As soon as that's done, I'm going to invite people, just come up when you're ready. Take a piece of bread, take a little um, thimble of wine. Maybe one day in the future we're going to do this a lot more extravagantly and have a good chunk of bread. 